If you're thinking of getting into electronically assisted astronomy, or EAA for short, there are six essential pieces of equipment that you'll need. Number one, optics to collect the light from the deep sky objects we want to view. Two, a mount to keep the optics on that target for the duration of our observation. Three, a camera which will take the photons of light collected by the optics and transform them into electronic bits of data. Four, a computer to communicate with the camera and to receive the electronic bits of data. Five, specific software that will take those bits of data and will transform them into images that we'll see on the computer screen. And finally, DC power. Because I have a lot of material to cover in these six essential items for EAA, I'm going to break this into multiple videos. So in this video, which we'll call part one, we will discuss how to choose optical tube assemblies and mounts for EAA. And don't forget to like this video if you found it useful. And you may want to subscribe if you want to see more videos on similar content to this. Plus, I'll put links to the suppliers that I use down below the video where it says show more. And I would appreciate it if you used those links for your purchases as it will help support my channel so I can bring you more content like this. Now the first item on our list is optics. And that would typically be an optical tube similar to one of the ones that you see here. But it could also be the telephoto lens from a, a 35 millimeter camera that you uh, own. Now there are two basic types of optical tube assemblies that are commonly used for EAA. There's the classic refractor like the two you see here. And then there's the reflectors like the Newtonian you see here and the Schmidt Cassegrain here. Now the most important thing in selecting the optical tube besides the price is the focal ratio. So EAA requires a fairly fast optics and that means something like a focal ratio of f7 or lower. Now that doesn't mean you can't get something that has a higher focal ratio so long as you can put a reducer on there and reduce the focal ratio down to f7 or lower. So the lower the focal ratio, the faster the optics, the more you'll see in a given period of time. Now let's go through the three different kinds of optics I have here. The Newtonian, the Schmidt Cassegrain, and the refractors one by one. Here's an example of a Newtonian OTA. This particular one is a, an Orion Starblast six inch reflector and the advantages of the Newtonians are that they are actually the least expensive per inch of aperture, meaning that you can get a fairly large aperture at a much lower cost than you can get from something like a refractor or an SCT. For instance, you can get a four inch Newtonian reflector for under $600 and an eight inch reflector for under $900. The other thing to know when you look at Newtonians, if that's your choice for EAA, is that you need to make sure that your camera will come to focus with the particular reflector that you're interested in. So this Starblast is designed for visual work only. So this camera cannot get close enough to the primary mirror. It needs to travel closer. It, that's called in focus. And so the travel on this will go out to focus with a lens in my eye, but it won't go in far enough to bring the sensor position of the camera to a focus point with this setup. So what you need to do is look for a Newtonian that's called either an imaging Newtonian or an astrograph. And those are designed so that they will come to focus with a camera and you won't have any trouble at all. And as I said, those, you can get those astrographs an uh, eight inch for under $900, a four inch for under $600. The other thing about Newtonians, which make them good for EAA, is they're typically around a focal ratio of F4. So that's fairly fast optics, which is what we want. The downside to that on Newtonians is they end up having coma. Now coma is 
the result of rays of light coming in at an off angle axis instead of coming down the center of the tube they come at an angle and then when they come to the image plane they cause the stars to look like comet tails because not all of the rays are focusing at the same point and that's called coma which Newtonians typically can suffer from. So you can take a look with your particular no Newtonian and if it's not objectionable then it's fine otherwise they do sell coma correctors are very commonly sold as accessories for Newtonians and they can cost anywhere from about 120 bucks to over $400 so keep that in mind when you uh, map out the total cost. Now the most common sizes for EAA are 4 inch 6 inch and 8 inch. Now that's not to say you can't use a 10 inch or a 12 inch uh, Newtonian to do EAA, EAA. You certainly can, but think about the length of this optical tube at 6 inch and F4. Uh, when you get to 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, the tube gets to be much uh, longer and harder to manage. So you need a much sturdier and probably a much more expensive mount and even then you're still going to notice any little vibrations from the wind and so forth. So that's why people doing EAA are satisfied with 8 inch and smaller. After all, we're going to get the effect of using the camera to add images together so that we can see more in a short period of time that we don't need to go to such large telescopes to begin with. Other thing about the Newtonian is taking off the cover plate. It's open air so the tube cools down quickly uh, compared to a refractor and especially an SCT will can take several hours depending on the size of the mirror and the SCT but with this open tube this will cool down faster one other key thing to look for, in addition to everything else I mentioned, is the focuser. Now this is where a lot of manufacturers may skimp on cost. You want to make sure the focuser is sturdy and will hold your camera. Most of the cameras we deal with in EAA are not that heavy, but if you have a coma corrector in the camera and you maybe have some extension or something there, you're going to have a little bit more weight and you want to make sure it can handle that. Also, this one is designed with a single speed focusing mechanism. You want one with a dual speed so you can do fine focusing as well. And um, the last thing to know about Newtonians is that they tend to require frequent collimations. Now, some people collimate every session so they get the sharpest uh, pinpoint stars possible. Once you learn how to do the collimation I think it's fairly fast. But those are the basic things that you need to consider if you plan to use a Newtonian for electronically assisted astronomy. schmidt cassegrain telescopes, or SCTs for short, are very popular for EAA because of their versatility and focal ratio, which I'll discuss in a minute, and also because of their compact optical design. You can find them in sizes from 5 inch all the way up to 14 inches in aperture. And the ones I have here are from Celestron, but Mead also makes a line of SCTs as well. Most of the comments I'm about to make apply to any SCT, although there are some specific to Celestron which I'll try to point out. Now an SCT is also a reflecting telescope just like a Newtonian. It has a primary mirror in the back, it has a secondary mirror in front, but in this case the secondary mirror does not reflect the light out through the side of the telescope like it does in a Newtonian but instead it reflects it back down through the optical axis and through a hole in the primary mirror and then out through a viewing port in the back of the telescope much like in a refractor. The other difference in an SCT relative to an Newtonian, because it has a spherical mirror it can suffer from spherical aberration which means that light rays that um, come through the aperture off-center can focus at a different position than light rays in the center. So to combat this, the schmidt cassegrain design adds a lens, a corrector lens at the front to 
take care of that spherical aberration and basically eliminate it. Since an SCT has a native focal ratio of f10, no matter whether it's a 5 inch, 14 inch, or any one in between, why would we think it's a good tool for EAA when I said we want to work at f7 and below? Well, the answer lies in the fact that it's very easy to reduce the focal ratio from f10 down to a more friendly EAA focal ratio. Now, Celestron sells a 6.3x focal reducer for about 190 bucks, which screws in the optical path on the back, and that will reduce the focal ratio to f6.3, which is a uh, good place to be for EAA. On the Meads, they make a, a 3.3x focal reducer, and that reduces it down to a uh, focal ratio of 3.3. Now, there's a second thing that we can do that is specific to Celestron telescopes. And basically, all of the Celestron telescopes from 6-inch up that are made nowadays has the ability to remove the secondary mirror and replace it with something called Hyperstar. Now, if you have an older telescope or you're looking to buy a used Celestron telescope, check to make sure that it is fast star or hyperstar compatible, as they call it. In any case, what you can do is you can purchase one of these hyperstar adapters. Now, this is a hyperstar adapter for an 11 inch. This is only a nine and a quarter inch telescope, so this isn't designed to fit on here, but it's an example that I can show you. So it's a very compound lens assembly, and you take out the secondary mirror and you screw this in in place and then you screw the camera on this end and then you take your subframes and images using the hyperstar now why do we do that because the hyperstar will reduce the focal ratio to f2 so the speed of an optical system is a function of the focal ratio so to compare f10 to f2 divide 10 by 2 you get 5 and square it, 25. So at f2, we're 25 times faster in optical speed than we are at f10. And in f6.3, we're two and, two and a half times faster than we are at f10. Now that's not to say that you can't use EAA at f10, and there are some very small deep sky objects that folks will use f10. Now these two telescopes are what are called standard SCTs. Celestron makes something called an EDGE SCT, and Mead sells it as an ACF. And those are both designed with additional optical elements to give crisper and sharper star images all the way to the edge of the field of view. Now for most EAA applications, you probably won't notice a great difference between the EDGE and the non-EDGE, but you will notice the great difference in price. For instance, in 8-inch SCT, standard SCT from Celestron, will cost you 1300 bucks. The edge version will cost you $300 more at 1600 bucks. And then the focal reducer for that 8-inch edge, you can't use this $190 focal reducer. You have to buy a $400 focal reducer uh, to get that down to F7. So my advice is unless you're doing astrophotography you don't need an edge and you don't need an acf version of these sct's you can just get by with the standard version and pay less for the tube and any accessories that you want to buy now you can also buy sct's either as the optical tube assembly by itself like i did with this nine and a quarter inch and mounted it on my celestron ceg e mount or you can buy a bundle. Now Celestron also bundles some of these optical tubes with their alt as mounts. And so they put a six inch and an eight inch SCT on something called their SE alt as mount. I would not recommend the eight inch on the SE mount. I think the eight inch is a little too heavy. Since this is a single arm um, alt as mount, you'll get some vibrations. You want, if you're going to get 8 inch, you want to move up to their evolution mount, which is a bit sturdier, a little bit pricier. 
but that would be the better combination. And the nine, they also make a nine and a quarter inch on the Evolution. And I'm hearing folks say that they think even that nine and a quarter is a little too much for the Evolution mount. Now for EAA, I think you'll find the most popular size of SCT is about eight inches because at eight inch, you have a perfect combination a fairly large aperture, which is generally not limited by sky seeing conditions. It's light enough to be easily transported and it's not that expensive. I have used six inch, eight inch, nine and a quarter, 11 and 14 inch. So pick whatever one fits your price budget and your objectives. Now, there are some other differences of SCTs compared to the other telescopes and one advantage, disadvantage of an SCT is it focuses by moving the primary mirror forward and back. The advantage is it gives you a lot of focus travel. So you're never going to run out of in or out focus with your camera. You may have to put extension tubes on there if you're using a focal reducer so that you get the right spacing of the camera image from the optics and the focal reducer, but you will always be able to come to focus. The bad side of that is when you adjust the focus, you will get the mirror will uh, move a little bit and you'll get some mirror shift. So it's a bit annoying. It's not uh, something that you need to terribly worry about, but just be aware of. The other nice thing about these things, as I said before, is these are nice compact tubes. They're sealed so the dust and the dirt doesn't easily get inside. It still gets inside, but not easily. The downside is it can take longer for the primary mirror to cool than, in a, than it can in a Newtonian telescope. I've been very happy using SCTs. In fact, SCTs are my primary uh, tool for doing EAA. Now, if you're looking for lightweight and low cost, I would recommend one of these bundles that has the, the Alt-As mount and the optical tube together but there's nothing wrong with buying the optical tube and putting it on the mount of choice. These are actually, obviously this is a much sturdier mount, but the six inch does quite well on this SC mount. And as I said, the eight inch on the Evolution mount is reported to be pretty steady. The last OTA design I'm gonna talk about is a refractor. And I have two examples here. I have an 80 millimeter refractor and a 127 millimeter refractor. Now, a good quality refractor is known for its high contrast and sharp images. And that's because it has no obstruction in the light path like a Newtonian or an SCT. Now, on the other hand, because refractors use lenses to capture and focus the light, and lenses are expensive to manufacture, and measured in cost per inch of aperture, refractors are typically much more expensive than the other types of OTAs we discussed. And when you get beyond five or even six inch, the cost becomes extraordinarily prohibitive. I mean, you can see quite a few eight inch Newtonians or SCTs out on the observing field, but you're not gonna see an eight inch refractor, not only because of the cost, but because of the weight of the optics and the size of the tube that would be required. And that would mean that you would have to have a pretty hefty mount. So typically you're gonna see maybe five inch or less out there in the field. And you'll see a lot that are 80 millimeters and even smaller than that. The biggest challenge for designers of refractors is something called chromatic aberration. And that simply means that a lens will not focus different colors of light at the same point. So in a refractor that has a single lens, the red, the blue, and the green light will all focus at a different focal plane. And you'll have poor color rendition and a very soft, mushy focus because you can't get all of the visible colors in focus at the same time. Now, chromatic aberration occurs because the different wavelengths of light passing through a piece of glass bend or refract different amounts. And the simplest example of this is a prism where you can clearly see the white light comes in one side and out come the different colors of the rainbow at different positions on the other side of the piece of, uh, on the other side of the prism. Now there are several approaches to combat this chromatic aberration because after all we don't want all the colors of light focusing at different points. 
we'd like to get them all to focus as close to possible on the same focal plane. Now the first approach is to replace the single lens with a doublet. And that's called an acromat because it's able to focus two wavelengths, the blue and the red, on the same focal plane, although the green will still be slightly out of focus. Now, an even better approach is to replace one of those elements in the doublet design with something called ED glass, or extra low dispersion glass. And what this means is it will bend or refract the colors of light uh, a little bit less than the standard glass. And so while the blue and the red will still be in the same plane of focus, the green won't be as much out of focus as if you didn't use an ED glass element. Now obviously ED glass is more expensive, so doublets with ED glass are more expensive than doublets with a simple crown and flint glass. Now many manufacturers sell these doublets with ED glass as apochromatic designs. But a true apochromat is defined as one that brings the green, the blue, and red into focus at the same plane. And that actually requires three glass elements. And as you can guess, the cost goes up still further. And it's very common for at least one of those three glass elements to be an ED type glass. But a true apochromatic design with three lenses, including ED glass, will give the sharpest focus and the truest color rendition. But it will cost you more than any of the other two designs. So where I see refractors most commonly used for electronically assisted astronomy is for wide field application and combined with a um, lightweight and low cost setup, something like this. And so what you'll see is a lot of folks will use 80 millimeter refractors or even 60, 61 millimeter refractors because they provide a very wide field of view of the night sky. So why is that important? Well, there are a lot of objects out there like the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, things like the North American Nebula that are quite large and they just won't fit in the field of view of something like an 8 inch Newtonian or SCT. But you can begin to fit these things in the field of view if you have a relatively large camera with something like an 80 millimeter and certainly a 60 or 61 millimeter refractor. For instance, this 80 millimeter refractor at f6.5 has nine times the field of view of an 8 inch SCT with a 6.3 focal reducer attached to it. And a 61 millimeter refractor at f5.5 has 14 times the field of view. So you're seeing a much bigger section of the sky. So you'll find many folks doing EAA may have a six or eight inch Newtonian or a six or eight inch SCT, but also have an 80 or 60 millimeter refractor so that they can go after these rather large deep sky objects. Now, in addition to looking at wide field objects with these smaller refractors, a 60, 61 millimeter doublet refractor with ED glass, will cost under $600, 500 to $600. An 80 millimeter doublet with ED glass, somewhere between 650 and $900. Now, if you want a triplet 80 millimeter, you're gonna to have to spend more than $1,000. Well, the lens design of the refractor is the first thing you wanna look at before deciding which one to purchase. There are several other features that you wanna take into account. First is the focusing mechanism, and you want to make sure this has a sturdy focuser that can handle the weight of a focal reducer and a camera. Because on refractors, unlike Newtonians, you're going to have to have some sufficient out travel, which refractors typically do. If not, you can add extension tubes to it. You want to make sure the weight of the camera and focal reducer, when you're extended out, is not going to cause sagging in the optical axis. You want to make sure you have a nice smooth two-speed focusing mechanism so you can get a sharp focus. And another thing that I recommend, this um, Orion uses slip fittings. So if I needed to put an extension on here, I have to use a slip fitting, which is okay, but it's not the most rigid fitting. Instead, you prefer to have a focusing mechanism that will allow you to put ex screw-on extensions like this Explore Scientific, which has either a slip fit or you take off one of the elements 
on the focuser in the back and you, then you screw on the additional extensions which are screw on type extensions which we use with this telescope when we use the focal reducer and a camera on the back and that provides the most rigid um, connection possible. As I said early on we want to be at about f7 or lower in focal ratio and most of these optical designs come in at around f6.5. You see some down at 5.5 and this one is f7 and you can even get focal reducers for refractors if you want to go lower. So for instance Explore Scientific sells a 7x focal reducer for this which will bring this just down below uh, f5. And what you'll find in general is that focal reducers for refractors typically run about 7x or 8x. And that's because the refractor is already in the f7 or lower range. And you can't really bring these refractors down below about f4.5 without seriously degrading the optical performance. But that's fine because anything below f7 works pretty good for EAA. The second essential piece of equipment is the mount, and not just any mount will do. You may have seen push to Dobsonian mounts where you move it around by hand to find your target and stay on target, or even ones that have mechanical knobs where you adjust the position and angle of the optical tube manually. Those just won't cut it because you won't be able to keep the object centered on the imaging chip in the camera and all you'll end up with is a very blurred image and you'll be sorely disappointed. So what you do need though is a motorized tracking mount and I have four different versions of motorized tracking mounts here. There are so many of them on the market but that's number one, a motorized tracking mount. The second consideration in choosing the mount is the payload capacity. So if you already have a telescope or you have a telescope you plan to buy, then you need to match the capacity of the mount to the telescope. On the other hand, if you already have a mount or you know the mount you want to buy, you need to make sure that whatever OTA you buy will not exceed the payload capacity of the mount. Now, the manufacturers typically spec the payload capacity and they tend to exaggerate a little bit I guess they're using capacity in terms of what we would use for visual observations. So in EAA, we're not as constrained as we are in astrophotography, where they always tell you, if you're going to do astrophotography, spend the most money on the mount. That's not true in EAA. We have a lot more latitude there, but we still want to have uh, a mount that will hold the camera and the optical tube steady on the target. So I would say assume that you would use uh, an estimate of 80% of the manufacturer's spec on capacity. So for instance, the rated capacity of this mount here from Skywatcher is 11 pounds. And I have a six and a half pound OTA here. This is an 80 millimeter Orion um, tel uh, refractor between the telescope and the camera, this is well less than 8.8 .8 pounds. So this mount, I don't think we'll have any trouble handling this tube here. But then this 127 millimeter refractor from Explore Scientific, it would be much too heavy for something like this mount, obviously, and even challenging for this um, CG5 mount from Celestron. This is the precursor to their um, AVX. They discontinued this and did some improvements and now they have the AVX mount. But I don't even think this one would be a good choice for the AVX mount. So the heavier, the bigger the telescope, the bigger the mount you want, or the bigger the mount you have or buy, the bigger the optical tube you can put on there. Now it isn't just the total weight of the optical tube, it's how that weight is distributed. So this is a six inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and this is a six inch Newtonian. Now, assume they were the same weight, although they're not necessarily the same weight. You can see this one is much more compact than this one. The weight of this is spread out over a larger uh, length. And so that means that this has a larger moment of inertia than this, and that puts more strain on the gears in the mount. 
So keep that in mind too. So not just the weight, but the uh, moment of inertia of the uh, scope that you have. Another reason that these longer tube optics uh, can be an issue is if you have some winds, then the mount needs to be very sturdy so that light winds won't cause this thing to move around a little bit and vibrate because you are um, magnifying everything when you're imaging with the camera. And so you'll see these small vibrations due to the wind and it'll blur some of your image frames. So keep all of those things in mind when choosing the mount. Now another thing to consider about the mount is the mount's weight. Now obviously a mount like this is gonna weigh a heck of a lot more than a mount like that. So if you have a permanent or semi-permanent setup, say in your backyard you have an observatory or you have a place where you can keep your telescope and mount and keep it covered for many days at a time, then the bigger mount should not be a problem because you just set it up once or a few times. But if you're gonna be going in and out of your house uh, to do your observing, it's gonna get pretty tiring to lug something like this back and forth from inside and outside to outside of your house. And so something like this, which I can just basically lift this up even with the optical tube on it, and obviously that's even lighter, this you can bring inside and outside and not even have to disassemble anything depending on um, your particular physical characteristics. So that's another thing to keep in mind when choosing the mount. Whether you want it to be lightweight and portable or you don't mind if it's heavier because you want to support a bigger optical tube. The last consideration when choosing a mount and perhaps one of the most important things that you'll have to decide is whether to use an alt as mount like these two here or an equatorial mount like these two here. Now, if you're planning to do astrophotography or you think you might uh, branch out into astrophotography, you're gonna have to get yourself an equatorial mount because an alt as mount will start to show field rotation for the ex length of exposures that are required for astrophotography. So let's look at the differences between an alt as and an equatorial mount. Now they both have two axes of rotation, but they're very different. And the difference is important to understand. An alt as mount rotates along the azimuth, which is along the plane of the horizon, and then along the altitude axis. So by rotating along those two axes, it can keep a star or an object centered in the frame of the camera. Now the problem is these two axes of rotation do not line up with the axis of rotation of the Earth unless you're at the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole, which I assume most of us are not. That means that objects in the field of view that are not dead center in the field of view will eventually appear to rotate about the center of the field of view. So if you've seen these pictures where people take a camera and do a long exposure with the camera pointed at, the, at Polaris, you see Polaris is stationary in the center and then you see these arcs for the stars as they rotate about Polaris. And so if you took a very long exposure with one of these alt as mounts, then you would start to see the same kind of thing and which would start to blur the image you're trying to look at. So if you're looking at a galaxy or a nebula, because all of that mass is starting to rotate in the image, it gets a bit blurred and it will be unsatisfying. So if that's the case, why did I say that an alt as mount is a option for EAA? Well, that's because we're typically going to take exposures that are fairly short relative the, to the amount of time it takes to show up field rotation. So if you stay under 30 seconds uh, for most locations in the sky, then you really won't uh, have enough field rotation to see it in the image. And when we do EAA, we do these short exposures, let's say five seconds or 10 seconds, and then we keep doing additional exposures. So why doesn't field rotation show up eventually with those additional exposures? Because the first exposure is a plane like this and the second exposure might start to be tilted and so on and so forth. And that's because the software we're gonna use will take 
each image and rotate and translate it so it matches the first image. So it'll line up all of the images. So when that software became available for EAA back around 2014, 2015, it opened up the option to use alt as mounts instead of equatorial mounts uh, for EAA. And today, alt as mounts are actually very, very popular with people doing EAA. And the reason for that is they tend to be lightweight, they tend to be lower cost, and uh, you don't have to pull or align them, so you can set them up fairly quickly, and they're easy to move around. Now, on the other hand, we have the equatorial mount, and the equatorial mount moves on these two axes, which are tilted relative to the horizon, depending on the latitude you're at, so that this will match the Earth's rotation. Now, in order to get it to accurately match the Earth's rotation, you have to do a polar alignment, which means align this axis of the optics to the North Celestial Pole. And that's not ex exactly difficult to do, but it takes a little more time than working with an alt as mount. But the reward is that you can actually take much longer exposures. You're not limited to 30 seconds. If you want to do several minutes of exposure uh, in stack frames of several minutes for EAA, you could do that with an equatorial mount. You couldn't do it with an alt as mount. And the other thing is if you're even thinking you might go into astrophotography at some point, you're going to need an equatorial mount because an alt as mount won't allow you to do the longer exposures that you're going to need for um, astrophotography. So that concludes part one in this series on the six essential items you need for EAA. In part two, I'll go over the key features that you'll want to look for when trying to decide which camera is best suited for your EAA application. And if you want to see that video, I suggest you subscribe to this channel, in which case you'll get notice when I post that video. If you enjoyed this and found it helpful, don't forget to like the video. You may also be interested to take a look at my website, californiaskies.com, where you'll find more content on astronomy equipment and techniques.